Hello, guys and girls. The program you are about to hear will be both fun and educational, but it is not a substitute for medical advice. Although we are doctors, we are not your doctors. Hello, and welcome to Travel Medicine. As always, I'm your friendly neighborhood internal medicine doc, Dr. J. Hey, oh, this is Dr. Santosh, your pediatric infectious disease doc and researcher. Now, Santosh, a few moments prior to turning the recorder on, yeah. we were trading wonderful jokes of the week. Terrible jokes? <laughs> I, I, would, I personally would call it wonderful. Dad joke of the them. week? I sure. Don't know. Dad, joke, dad joke of the week is up there, yeah. And, and you had a fantastic one. Which has yeah. absolutely nothing to do, I want to be clear, nothing to do with what we're going to be talking about today. Yes, absolutely. But it's right up my alley as an infectious disease specialist. So, hey everybody, have you heard the what about the rising political tensions between yogurt and penicillin? One side is probiotic and the other is antibiotic. They're calling <laughs> it a culture war. <laughs> Ah, oh, I love that it's a double uh, punchline. <laughs> it's amazing. As for this week, we had already started talking a little bit about how design influences medicine in all sorts of ways, uh, from the floor plan of the hospital to the design of a hospital itself. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the surprising ways that that went back to the early 1900s. Or early eighteen okay. hundreds, and <laughs> okay. also prison design. Oh, okay. <laughs> but all right, all right. And you're talking about beyond. Well, a, a good amount about functionality, but also a little bit beyond functionality as well. Did you ever end up getting a chance to look more at that hospital in Rwanda I sent you? I did. Yeah, after we finished online, I just spent. Uh, they don't have a lot of you know, different photos. They have a lot of the same photos published on different websites and stuff, but they're all absolutely gorgeous. And the one thing that I could not get over is how beautifully those architects adapted hospital to the needs that would be in Rwanda. So specific to the region, usable by the local population for what they needed, how they needed, and then utilizing, you know, the local, uh, whatever it is, landscape and wind flows, just like you showed us, they, they made a, uh, you know, like almost like a little negative pressure room, just using roofs and vents and stuff and just letting the wind uh, blow through the ward. I, I was absolutely amazed by it. Um, I, I, I love it. It's one of my favorite. Favorite things. Now, in that episode, we emphasized the architecture of the building and specifically wide access to windows, nature views. But what do you do when you've got, you know, the kind of older hospitals that we work in, or at least yeah. that I've worked in frequently? Sure. Where you still have to find some way to, for lack of a better word, liven up the place, but you don't have access to those kinds of funds or reconstruction budgets. Well, oh, oh, so tear it down and build something new is off the table. Not in the short term. Got it. Uh, okay. And there was simply too much to cram into a single episode. So we return now for part two of designing medicine. <laughs> All of you folks who uh, are younger than a certain age, and Josh, I, I don't remember exactly where the cutoff is there, but please do take a quick second and Google designing women which Josh is riffing off of right now. And after you're done listening to this amazing episode, go find a place where you can watch a few episodes of Designing Women because that show was delightful. So we're going to be continuing on uh, focusing on, again, areas of design that maybe aren't contributing as directly to healing, but still have a pretty interesting medical history. So we had started to talk about Florence Nightingale being a figure who really influenced medical architecture. Yeah. And I learned something brand new when you talked about it, Josh, because 
you know, I know Florence as a field nurse, uh, you know, out in the middle of you know, warfare and everything and taking care of people, improvising, doing the best that she could with the resources that she had. Um, and then, of course, codifying some of the rules of nursing. But I never thought of her as like a building planner. Well, it's not like she was sitting there with the blueprints themselves, but she had a lot of opinions and they were great ones. <laughs> okay. So in addition to the architecture or the layout of wards that she proposed, she also recognized the importance of art in medicine. And notes on nursing, she wrote the effect of beautiful objects, variety of objects, and brilliance of color is hardly at all appreciated. Little as we know about the way in which we are affected by form, by color and light, we do know this, that they have an actual physical effect. Presented to patients, they can be actual means of recovery. Wow. Yeah, and and this is something that you taught us. Uh, on the previous of these two episodes that now we have actual data that when folks who are on the mend, who are healing, especially from surgical procedures, when they are able to look outside, even if they can't go outside, if they have a window or something beautiful, they look at, they had a significantly shorter recovery time and better outcomes than if they just had no windows or a blank wall. However, given that she was talking about the importance of nice things to look at in 1859, we did yeah. talk about the, the addition of windows. Mm -hmm. What's something I bet you pass by in the hospital every day? Notice, but don't really think about. Uh, oh, so many things. <laughs> oh, if you okay. say patients or nurses, you won't be no. in such trouble. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I am a pediatrician and I do actually think about this quite a bit, but it's become very routine for me. We have decorations all over our walls, often, you know, pastoral scenes, butterflies and flowers and that kind of a thing. Um, puppies running along the ground, that kind of thing. But uh, you're right. After a while, they kind of fade into the background. Yeah. So the hospital art. Yeah. When's the last time that you actually thought about hospital art? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm very lucky to be where I am. We actually do have a, an art department um, and actually a little school of arts and sciences that's very in touch with our clinical staff. And when I first moved into my office, I was strongly encouraged to go through our art collection so that I could actually choose something to be mounted on the wall in my office. So um, it's actually given a very high priority at my center. So um, yeah, I, I think of it uh, probably a little bit more than most physicians do. And we do have a beautiful, beautiful collection with pieces up all over our, our hospital. What piece did you choose and why? <laughs> I chose a uh, a picture. I think it's called Two Finches. I can't remember the name of the artist, but it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's drawn in an older style from Japan where it has uh, a, a green blue background, a branch uh, coming out, and then on either side, uh, two birds, two finches kind of alight on the branch. And, you know, just uh, hanging out, hanging out with me. And, you know, they're, they're my two buddies. When I get too tired um, doing my notes, then I can turn away and, you know, look for look at them for a little bit. And, you know, just kind of pretend I'm outside and looking at the birds. <laughs> I was expecting some sort of bacteria. Oh, no. <laughs> the, the desktop wallpaper on my computer actually has toxoplasma. <laughs> there and, we go. There yeah, we then, go. Sitting sitting on my shelf above, like in front of my books, are my mighty microbes, yeah, the plush toys. I'm thrilled that you have the opportunity at your institution to have an art library. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and so, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But do you know when art started appearing in hospitals? If you had to guess, bar trivia time. Yeah. Give me a well, decade. <laughs> so... 
I'm wondering if there was a gap for a little bit. Um, so I don't know how, you know, more ancient hospitals, which essentially were like converted monasteries, like what they had on the walls or that kind of a thing. But I know that if you come around to the very sterile appearing, appearing, uh, wards that we talk about post World War II. So 19s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, they were very, very bare with those horrible, like pasty, you know, beige colored walls, which are just awful. Um, but I, I think before then, if you go back to like Europe and stuff, I'm certain that at least for aristocracy, they had paintings uh, in, in the hospitals, uh, you know, in the 1700s, 1800s, maybe. There may have been in private clinics or monastery based ones, but pretty much from the entire first half of the 20th century. Yeah. Uh, oh, it was okay. a more sterile approach and little to no art was seen until the 1960s in the US and oh around 1979 in the UK. Oh, holy cow, so very recent. You know, there may be the occasional picture here or there by some optimistic employee, but yeah. there was no formal sort of program to put anything in place. So for example, in 1979, in London, the King's Fund established murals for hospital decoration scheme, which I love that it's called a scheme. It's very British. <laughs> That's fair. like it's a uh, they 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 should have maybe called it a plot <laughs> to to give it a more sinister feel. <laughs> also, also known as the Art in Hospital scheme, and it's just one dude named Art. Going around <laughs> and and rubbing his hands together and saying, good, good. <laughs> but the reason they started putting more art in hospitals was not uh, without some clinical testing. Uh, surprisingly, a randomized controlled trial, which I did not think I was going to find in a story about art. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, I I was expecting something because you did throw some pretty cool data at us in the last episode. So uh, researcher Tse, T-S-E, uh, et al., okay. right. demonstrated an increased pain threshold as well as pain tolerance when participants were exposed to soundless video displays of nature as opposed to a blank screen. So like just even putting on Pleasant photos of outdoor scenes on the television. So think about what sort okay, of screensavers yeah. you're getting on hospital TVs. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. Um, and visual images, which can be more easily incorporated into healthcare settings than video or window views, have also been studied. So essentially, he's saying if you have these old hospitals that you can't replace or for whatever environmental reasons are not practical to have wide open windows, sure. just mm -hmm. put up essentially iPads with nature scenes on the walls, and that will still improve patient stay, people's anxiety, their pain tolerance, and their pain threshold. And don't worry, he wasn't going around kneecapping people to discover this. <laughs> well, so uh, it's funny that you say that. Usually, if you want it to be extremely controlled and you want to use pain as your, you know, your, your main indicator, the there are a few standardized models for pain, but the most common one is actually to dunk your hand into ice cold water, which you guys might have seen on the Mythbusters. Uh, if you ever take a look, they were trying to prove whether or not swearing, uh, like cussing, made it better to tolerate pain. They made it easier to tolerate pain. So that's a standard model that they use. But I'm guessing it, it sounds like he doesn't even do that. Yeah, <laughs> he just he <laughs> he just let the you know it was observational kind of a thing. Well, it was also in in one particular trial, uh, patients sure. undergoing chemotherapy. Very discomforting, not just painful, but you have nausea and you know just aches and pains and fever. So yeah, you you just feel yucky all over. Now, in a different study done by Diet and colleagues. Okay. Nature themes specifically as art were, were looked at in patients undergoing bronchoscopy. 
and oh, they well, found. <laughs> well, they, well they I, I, this, this is important because this is not this is not limited to just chemo patients. It's like, well, of course, art's going to make people, you know, with these. They're like, no, from the whole range of yeah. medical procedures. No, no, no. Illnesses. I was laughing because usually you're anesthetized and put to sleep when someone's shoving a giant scope down your lungs. So I'm guessing this is for after or before. <laughs> yes, they they didn't just yeah. say, see this plant? <laughs> down the hatch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So they weren't like they weren't trying to do anesthesia versus art. It was this was in the recovery period. <laughs> Pain okay. control yes. was significantly better in the intervention group. Okay. With less post operative or post-procedural anxiety and more likely to switch from strong analgesics to weaker painkillers during their recovery. Uh, This is also seen by a study done by Ulrich with patients recovering from open heart surgery like cabbage. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. A coronary artery bypass graft, C-A-B-G, not, you know, not surgery on a cabbage. (laughs) And the two biggest categories that kept coming up in all these studies were nature themes like landscapes and abstracts. Oh, oh, so you could use like a, I know you hate this artist, Josh, but like a Jackson Pollock. Oh, and that's exactly (laughs) why you can't because, (laughs) because apparently I assume it enrages patients. (laughs) So if you, if you were one of the, you, you know, the, the patients in this trial, you would be an anomalous result if they gave you a Jackson Pollock rather than like a beautiful pastoral scene. I'd just be like screaming down the halls. Yeah. <laughs> Get it out. <laughs> this is not art. A two-year-old could make it. Ah! <laughs> and then I'd come across a picture of like two cows grazing in a field and be like, oh, well, that's dumb. Yeah. Like, but, but calming. Yeah. This is, as far as the outdoor scenes, I very, very much understand what's going on because there has been now data piled on type of data that being in the outdoors, being exposed to, uh, you know, very untouched nature type of scenes or being in those environments reduces stress in multiple different scenarios, including in like mood disorders like depression. So it's no surprise that the 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 outdoor scenes do it like that but i'm guessing you got to be a little more careful in terms of taste with the uh, abstract stuff <laughs> yeah listen these hospitals are at their own discretion but the science is basically saying nobody wants to see your scribbles and ink blots <laughs> <laughs> oh god all right a- angry postmodernist artist please don't write in <laughs> Okay. They can't. I'll get sent like a graham cracker broken into 12 pieces. Yeah. Oh, and th- which represents the angst of <laughs> the entire universe kind of thing. Repre- <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, that said, okay. art budgets are part of the design plan when creating a new hospital. Wow. Okay. So they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're f- setting aside wall spaces and stuff like that specifically so that art can go up yeah their budgets are factored in for furniture lighting signage floor and wall treatments as well as what kind of art to choose and hang on the walls and the patient rooms for example every single pediatric unit i've ever been in has pictures of smiling babies scattered throughout the hallways (laughs) yeah yeah we like also animals um dogs dressed up as humans is a popular favorite one i kind of wish that was in regular hospital (laughs) hallways. yeah 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 like uh, uh, a a labrador retriever in a in a dashing suit you know kind of a thing it's like it's funny because that dog doesn't go to the office (laughs) it also assists aside from the soothing welcoming aspect Mm-hmm. It acts as signage and wayfinding. So artwork can help to clarify the boundaries of public and non-public spaces and hospitals. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. So 
you instead of being like you know go down the way you know and, and turn at the fourth door you can be like oh just go past the picasso and turn left yeah or think about if you're wandering around in a hospital and all of a sudden there's no art on the walls you're yeah. probably somewhere that you shouldn't be oh god <laughs> got gotcha. you or at least without yeah. purpose Sure, sure. Got it, got it, got it. They don't, put, yeah. <laughs> they don't put potted plants in sterile surgical corridors. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> yeah. But you'll see entrances to the hospital, waiting rooms, patient rooms, cafeterias, and all of that is determined by an art consultant who's part of a design team. Oh, wow. Okay. So there are definitely, I I wouldn't call them pieces of art, but there are posters and that kind of a thing, which is specifically just for our hospital, talking about services that we have and that kind of a thing, or, or celebrating some of our awards. But this is separate from that, right? This is actually, you know, art for the sake of art going up on the walls. Well, art to promote a calm healing environment or to increase pain tolerance, decrease recovery time. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, But some hospitals, yeah. Art for the sake of art. They even have art tours, which is not the kind of thing you think. (laughs) Because I know you said you were very proud that your institution has an art loan program. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Now, is that open to everyone or just the physicians? Um, so anybody who has an office, so our administrators, some of our upper level administrators that are, uh, you know, managers and that kind of a thing, but they have their own office, they can ask for something. We don't have any small pieces, I don't think that can go up in cubicles, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I, everyone is highly encouraged, like you move in, you sign your contract and everything. And then one of the next things is, you know, hey, what type of art would you like in there? Uh, and yeah. Now, one example is Duke University, which has three different self-guided art tours of their hospital's permanent collection. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, this is not as wonderful as it sounds. You know, the the silver lining is, oh, they're designed spaces for reflection and quiet contemplation because many families can be in the waiting room for up to a week. Oh, (laughs) that's true. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Now, let's say you can't leave your room. Uh, Sure. Yes. If for one reason or another, if you're stuck. There's a lot of reasons you may be bed bound. Sure, sure. Uh, Then the gift of art program at Michigan Medicine will bring art to you on their art cart. Ah, I love that. They bring carts of framed posters to patient floors, just like you would see with pet therapy, except instead of a dog, it's a painting. Yay, that's so good. At the end of their stay, patients can purchase works that have become companions during their hospital visit. That is a short story waiting to happen. Like some guy just stares at the painting across his hospital bed Mm -hmm. day in and day out through his entire convalescence, associates it with his recovery, and at the end of the day, decides to take it with him. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And then continues, hopefully, to feel better and better. It's uh, very, as, uh, very so. Kafka-esque. Yeah, absolutely. I like it. I like it. It's not just yeah. a low-tech or analog solution, uh, although that is one application. You also can start showing movies in the corridors or waiting rooms. Oh, yeah. We, we had quite a few of these where... Uh, we, we had to figure out how to do it properly, but we had quite a few of these where we just put up flat panel LCDs and, you know, we could either put announcements and things on there, you know, for, uh, you know, actually saying, oh, you know, grand rounds at noon or something like that. Or we could put it up as a beautiful piece of art or maybe something funny. I'm going to give you a couple other modern design things that have been done. And just the range of technology is pretty impressive. Uh, In all All of this hospital's 15 waiting rooms are monitors displaying films recorded by Alwyn Schoen. I initially read that as Oliver Stone, and I'm like, that is some heavy 
<laughs> media to consume. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe a little little much. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay, okay. But no. Uh all natural born healers. All when shown. The videos that he gotcha. puts up have landscape and nature themes like the passing of clouds, ripples in a pool, gently waving tree branches, except what he keeps complaining to the hospital about is the nurses rearrange the chairs in the rooms yeah. so not everybody gets the optimal view. Okay, so <laughs> I mean they're they're there to see, you know, to visit their ailing friend or you know, family member, but uh, I guess that the art, like looking at the art, is a close second. I actually don't know what's on the TVs in the waiting room anymore. It's not a part of the hospital I usually hang out in. For some reason, I was thinking of in the patient room. Well, that too. Gotcha. Uh, but okay. in Glasgow, okay, the walls in the clinic are known as programmable spaces. Oh, and okay. okay. And are designated for the display of paintings that can be supplied by organizations or auctioned off to, well, not the highest bidder, but auctioned off to local artists to display. Oh, I see. I see. So if there is a, if an artist comes along and say, hey, I'd really like to put this art here, then they can, they can request that space, you know, kind of ask the uh, art manager of the hospital and then the art manager can give them like a thumbs up or thumbs down. Correct. I also like okay. the idea that he's like, you know, the gallery was too expensive. Will you please display, get out of here. You filthy abstract modern artist. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want uh, your yeah. kind. Uh, you you Come. hate abstract art so much. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Come oh, back with God. a picture of a tree or a bowl of fruit. Yeah. They're, they're supposed to be evocative and kind of stir something, you know, deep inside you and, and, and allow your own characters. imagination to. <laughs> You're just not having it. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Okay. The next. Yeah part is the windows themselves in waiting rooms that overlook courtyards another uk mm -hmm. hospital has the latin names of the trees in the surrounding view sandblasted onto the windows oh okay oh that's oh so it's like an etching <laughs> but when they took a survey some members to... some members of the group felt because the general population was unfamiliar with latin people wouldn't engage positively with the words, but the artist contended. Okay. He's like, no, 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 no. The absence of meaning gives even more emphasis to the sound and rhythm of the words and pointed presumably to Harry Potter. He's like, no, Birch Guardian Leviosa. Uh, that's, that's a pretty cool way to, you know, if you don't have nature to show, of course, you don't want to get rid of the window and replace it with an art piece. If you can show the outside, because just being able to see outside is healing and important. So yeah, sandblasting or etching a scene uh, into uh, you know into the window, or in this case, actually like putting the label of the tree onto the window. You know, that's pretty cool. I like it. Yeah, and as you noted, a lot of hospitals now have art directors who choose how to purchase and obtain art. Uh, very yeah. similar to the ones who I presumably choose art for roadside diners. Oh. <laughs> sure, sure. I don't know, where, I, like, aside from yeah. museums and hospitals, who else requires an art curator? <laughs> so you definitely get personal art curators for your house. You can you can hire someone to come in. Um, but um, office spaces, so, ex you know, not just executive spaces, but, um, you know, large office buildings where, and I don't know what's going to happen in the near future, Josh, if, you know, commuting is going to become a thing again, <laughs> or if all of our office buildings are going to go away. But for now, with office buildings in place, you know, when you have a lot of people coming in and out, again, there used to be this philosophy of like, oh, you know, sterile kind of austere conditions so that, you know, workers just kind of work and that kind of a thing. But no, it, it's becoming more and more in vogue that you want to, you know, 
put beautiful things in your office to make it welcoming and, and you know, at least semi happy place to come to. And speaking of offices, let's move on a little bit to talk about some of the design in an outpatient clinic. We've spent a lot of time talking about hospitals where we work. The way you design a place for patients to stay longer term than just overnight uh, or to stay even shorter than just a couple, you know, 30 minutes to an hour yeah. is going to affect the design. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is the waiting room and the exam room, which can be a very scary place. Yeah. Exam rooms are designed to not feel claustrophobic. You want, a, I guess, a good mix of feeling sterile, but not clinical and mm -hmm. large, yeah. but not claustrophobic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's got to, you, it can't be cluttered. Um, you need to be able to move around. Sometimes you need to do procedures like incision and drainage or, you know, a phlebotomy to collect blood. So you need to be able to get around. And likewise, you're right. It needs to be clean for the love of God. Please don't transmit yeah. infections around the. <laughs> Uh, or the procedure room may be relegated to one or two rooms rather sure. than all of them just for space concerns. Right. But even choosing music can impact the experience. Uh, it may be beneficial to allow a patient to choose their own music. Mm -hmm. Okay. Such as providing them with headphones to listen to whatever programming is on the television or radio. As or, opposed to the looping Kenny G that was going on through the 90s perpetually? Yeah, so you could curate a specific playlist to relax to pay, or to get people to pay attention. And about 60% of patients and over half the staff in offices when surveyed have all reported that they were in favor of music. They didn't get into what kind, just in favor of music. Okay, uh, however. Gotcha. And it's more about background versus foreground. So, you know, if something's sure. in the background, regardless of what it is, very comfortable. Kenny G is a great background singer. So is Yanni. <laughs> Offspring in Blink-182, less common, <laughs> to be fair, this pains me to say it, probably less common in our day, although it would not surprise me to crumble into dust upon hearing Blink-182 on the oldie station <laughs> at, my at my doctor's office. <laughs> Welcome to Classics and Oldies. <laughs> There's like Get an entire... Up, get down with the sickness, your mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know that wasn't Blink, but you know. So. And all the girlies say I'm pretty fly for a white guy. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's not even going to the level of, say, Real Big Fish or Mighty Mighty Boston's when there was a whole ska era. Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah anyway background music was preferred to foreground which could be perceived as additional anxiety so it wasn't so much the high decibels it's the kind of music and whether it could be relegated to your attention sure um you know what's something that can play on loop endlessly without causing somebody to get as upset no. as they would say <laughs> looking at an abstract painting yeah and you have to keep in mind with music as as well as with visual art, you do want to make your patients feel comfortable and, uh, you know, soothed and all that kind of a thing. But it is important also that you don't drive yourself or your office staff crazy because you certainly can if, okay, well, it's soothing the first five times. But if you run this thing, you know, 20 plus times, I'm going to tear the walls down kind of thing. <laughs> Given how, at least from the patient side of things, a lot of people may not feel control over their environment or their general health, offering headphones and a choice of playlists uh, surprisingly can statistically significantly increase their confidence in their treatment and their sense of agency. So wow, just okay. something as simple as being able to control the music, some small factor of your doctor's visit um, can lessen anxiety. Now, again, these are all very small studies, low power, but the fact that they've been studied at all is fascinating. And again, it goes to show the importance of design as a feature of healing. 
And I, I fully understand what you're talking about, Josh. When a person goes to the doctor, I mean, we're, we're doctors, but when we go to our doctors, you are to a pretty good extent surrendering your autonomy for quite a bit, right? You're, you're asking someone, um, you know, to, and you're giving them permission to lay their hands on you, to come into your personal space, to ask very personal questions a lot of the time. And then, sometimes make decisions that will help you that, you know, will save your life, but are very scary. And so you relegate that kind of decision, um, you know, to the person with the expertise in the room. So I, I fully understand what you're talking about, giving the patient back some, some modicum of control. Now we've talked about how music choice can affect health or perception of healing, how Mm -hmm. art is selected, and even how designs of buildings in a previous episode has an influence. Where else are you exposed to medicine outside of hospitals and clinics (sighs) and pharmacies? (laughs) Well, Josh, if I had it my way, uh, nowhere else <laughs> you'd go you'd go on the internet and you'd have scholarly sources available to you that were peer reviewed and checked uh but otherwise it wouldn't be on there but of course if anybody owns a tv out there especially in the united states and maybe we're telling our friends over in europe and other some scary news but I think in the 90s it was, the United States decided that it was okay to display pharmaceutical advertisements on TV (laughs) and on billboards and such, which I think is the stupidest thing of all time. Yeah. (laughs) So horrible. But yeah, yeah, they they did it. Uh, So In September 1985... The mm-hmm. FDA rescinded the moratorium on direct-to-consumer advertising and just required that they meet the same legal requirements as those directed at physicians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, there was... So uh, as long as they pitch to... to you the same way... Yes. So as long as they pitch to you at home the same way that they would pitch to us, totally right. okay. They do not need to change the language. And in fact, they rely on not doing that. (laughs) The poor, the poor patient, sometimes the, the person who's watching this, who's not at all a doctor or nurse is, you know, sometimes they're looking at this thing and hearing a bunch of medically jargony gobbledygook and all they know is that they saw it on the TV and it relates maybe to their condition. Um, But Josh, I think the scarier part of it really is that we physicians are exposed to this. And I'm a big, big proponent. I think it's really important to say we physicians should look at pharmaceutical advertising as absolutely little as possible. We should be gathering our knowledge from scholarly sources only. And this completely undermines that. So I'm going to link to in the show notes the very first prescription drug commercial. What drug do you think uh, it was? <laughs> um, I remember all the way back, presidential, uh, what do you call them, uh, campaigns uh mr bob dole actually um advertising viagra i think it was uh yeah (laughs) even even earlier santosh no so earlier 1981 okay so unless your memory goes a little bit further back than mine does (laughs) <laughs> no, I I was a one year old, so I I would have to really search my memory. Um, I I do remember for a while, um, the leading like prescription medication that was out everywhere was uh actually Zantac and antacid. Was is that it? It was a drug called Rufin. R- what was a British pronunciation of ibuprofen? Oh. <laughs> Okay. Okay. All right. Made, so, and was 
Made by this was Boots, pharmaceutical right or made by Boots Pharmaceuticals. And okay. an interviewer asked the company president to describe who are the main customers for your commercial. And he mm-hmm. said, doctors. And the interviewer yes. responded, you know, well, why isn't the, the consumer? And the very first broadcast television commercial for a prescription drug, the pain reliever Rufin, was right. posted May 19th, 1983. And within two hours, the federal government, or sorry, within two days, the federal government told the company, take it down. And over yes. 30 years later, we are still fighting to prevent direct to consumer advertising. <laughs> oh, God. It's such a bad idea. It's such a horrible idea. Ay, ay, ay. I, I'm all for freedom of information. Everyone should have access to good and uh, accurate information, but this is shilling. It's so bad. And here's the problem. those That first ad kind of set the tone for a lot of these because they didn't know how to regulate it, so it never made okay. any specific medical claims about the pain reliever. It just, told, <laughs> it just told viewers that yeah. if they were taking the brand's name, Motrin... Right. Rufin was available cheaper. Like you had to be a user of the drug to even know what the ad was talking about. Got it. Got it. Okay. So they didn't even have anything about like as effective or all that kind of thing. So, you know, for instance, if, if a commercial nowadays, if they're saying that, oh, they can't say like this cures this, you, you can't, you can't say that you can say in a clinical trial and then you have to quote the results of the clinical trial, which again, if to a person who doesn't know what they're hearing can sound like absolute gobbledygook. So yeah. It, it, so in this case, Josh, they didn't even talk about the mechanism of the drug or like what it did. It just it was like, are you taking this? Well, this is a cheaper version of this. You know? Oh, it gets better. There's <laughs> okay. also, of course, the expected sexual innuendo. <laughs> that you get in commercials. Yeah, for example, yeah. uh, for example, one uh, that actually led to again the same moratorium <laughs> okay. was for a diuretic that angered the FDA commissioner so much that <laughs> the the never aired spot called Dolores involved <laughs> Oh oh <laughs> just, in involved a firefighter Okay. Making some suggestive comments with a hose, implying the diuretic being advertised didn't have the negative sexual side effects that some other similar drugs did. <laughs> okay, so for those who don't know, diuretic, just very simply, it makes you pee. So, you know, whatever mechanism it uses, there's many different mechanisms, but it's often used in heart failure to get water out of you so that you don't retain water. And yeah, it's, it just helps you to pee, it makes you pee stuff out. So, <laughs> it, so when, this, <laughs> this ended. So 1983, the very first drug ad went up on the air. 48 hours <laughs> later, it was taken down. Sure. A couple other companies aired. This one went up and then that's it. No more, no more drug consumer advertising until 1985. Oh, oh, okay. So that's why there was such a big gap. All right. Gotcha. And there had to be very rigid rules for disclosing side effects and uh-huh. no specific health claims by specific drugs okay. until you started getting, and here's where it starts turning into more of what we are frustrated by, Santosh, which is, uh, yes. and this was for Claritin. Um, okay. The company put a huge television campaign for Claritin on the air that never actually said what it was for, what it was supposed to treat, <laughs> what it was for curing, who the target audience was. The ad just implored viewers again and again to see their doctor. It's time, yes. said a voice matching the visuals. <laughs> and because they weren't making specific claims, they were allowed to simply keep putting their name out there. This sort of wore the FDA down. And by 1997, they began to relax the rules. And drug makers could now refer viewers to print ads, offer 1 800 numbers or websites, as long as they encouraged people to talk to their doctor if they wanted the additional information that the FDA had previously required you to include on the TV ad. 
So a lot of times before you had the micro machine guy listing the side effects, like, you know, you may have itchy, yeah. crash, <laughs> diarrhea, or sometimes <laughs> death, bad taxes, bad karma, bad credit. Um, sure, sure. <laughs> now you could simply, instead of listing all those side effects, say, you know, drug bibbity bobbity boo is cheaper than drug X. If you'd like to know more about side effects, talk to your doctor and call our 1-800 number. The only thing that I can kind of sort of say, but I, I don't know. I haven't kind of internally checked on this stuff because these you know commercials have gone all the way from, like you're saying, Claritin, which is for allergies, all the way to heavy-duty chemotherapies, Josh, like really, you know, very, very controlled, scary drugs that you should not just be tossing about. And I, I I think there's been enough fatigue just because, you know, being peppered with these ads over and over and then the scope of the different ads, you know, going into, into all these different professions that I've kind of become numb to them. But I don't know because this is the one thing that we don't understand, right? Every single time that a physician uh, or a group of physicians are surveyed and they say, how much does this affect you? How, how much does it, you know, change how you prescribe or that kind of thing? Inevitably we underestimate how big of an influence these commercials have on us. So, you know, we, we do have to be really vigilant about this. Um, but I, I feel personally like I don't even see them anymore that I'm just burned out, but I don't know. Now think back to all those drug commercials you remember from your childhood. They really did make very vague claims, and that was <laughs> legally required. Yes. <laughs> you know, what really, what is a nighttime sniffling, sneezing, stuffy head, coffee nose? <laughs> <laughs> so I can rest medicine. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> you also have to think about when they're making these commercials, again, the music, what kind of music is going to make you buy drugs? <laughs> well, it's very funny because now it's kind of all over the place, right? There's, there's happy, punchy, you know, upbeat music. And then for, you know, when they're, when they're advertising chemotherapy, and they're saying, oh, you know, th these horrible fucking ads that <laughs> they say, oh, would you like one more year of like, this nonsense? And yeah, it, it, that one is very like kind of that, you know, almost uh, what do you call it? Like a soap opera type of, you know, overture type of music kind of a thing. Um yeah, but it used to be all very, you know, kind of soothy, I, you know, quiet, chill kind of music. Pastoral scene, you know, a person dancing through the fields with butterflies and whatnot. I mean, I guess it's what, what condition or disease are you trying to sell? And while I don't have a great answer, I am going to link in the show notes to some stock footage, uh, stock songs specifically aimed at helping to give you ideas of what to use to sell your new pharmaceutical. And okay. one of the first ones I love, it says, you know, you have to be authoritative and straightforward. This song features a simple winning xylophone, plinking out a tune that <laughs> feels authentic and wholesome, the kind of qualities you want from the company making your medicine. <laughs> and just the descriptions are so corporate. Yeah. I, I want to create fake drugs to sell to this music. <laughs> well, they have been parodied quite a bit up and down. So yes, I, I do understand that impulse. But that's it for this week and this installment of Designing Medicine. You know, we're working our way from the facade of the building to its corridors and mm -hmm. even the art hung on the wall. I can't wait to find out what aspect of healing that we don't even think about is contributing next. Yeah. I, I, you know, we got visual arts, we've got music, Josh, I'm going to guess that just, you know, going through the other senses and whatever it is that probably smell is going to be the next one that's tackled that, you know, we actually have 
soothing and good aromas, whichever, whatever those means to, to help us heal. This hospital bed tastes of schnozberries. <laughs> Sir, stop, stop <laughs> chewing on the mattress. <laughs> Nurse, he's <laughs> just <laughs> chewing on the mattress. That's it for this week. As always, we love to hear your comments, questions, and feedback. If you'd like to support us spiritually, no, emotionally, no, he's chewing. He's <laughs> chewing on the mat. He's. <laughs> It's a giant marshmallow. If you'd like to support us spiritually, emotionally, or financially, links to do that are yeah, in the show notes. If you have to restrain him, you got to do what you got to do. Or you just... <laughs> Along with links to further reading, such as studies used in research in this mean, episode. It's good for gut health. Don't be like, no. The just... theme music is composed by Rachel Lesher. Fiber, go to hell. No. <laughs> And until next time, as always, keep a song in your heart, soap on your hands, a shot in your arm. Find some place to go where you can taste the medicine, smell the healing, and feel good. And once you've done all that, happy travels. Bye, everybody.